pew, pew. Pew, pew. Many years I've had this optic. In fact, it was the first optic that I reviewed on this channel, primarily because this is the optic that I found on sale from Optics Planet probably five years ago or so, and didn't have any information that I could find on it. And that's this. This is the optic that made me make my channel to what it is today. Pew, pew. It is, of course, the Steiner P4XI 1-4 featuring the P3TR reticle. Pew, pew. This thing is a small, lightweight, very handy, very functional LPVO, and I absolutely love the thing. I've recommended it to many people over many years, but here's the thing. Is it still viable in today's market? Pew, pew. You see, when I first bought this, the original going rate was around 500 bucks, which was fairly cheap for what it was. Pew, pew. But Optics Planet One Black Friday was running such a good sale on this, I ended up just saying screw it and bought two. The subsequent result of that was, I decided to make my first recording rig my Mark I and make this channel. Thus, many years later, here we are. I wanted to give you guys the information that I was originally looking for, which was ultimately, what is it like to actually get behind and use? That was the only piece of information I couldn't get anywhere online. So be the change you want to see in the world. Ultimately, the question on this entire optic isn't going to be, you know, is it still good? I still think it's great. I'm just going to reiterate that I think it's great and prove it to you guys. But is it worth its new price, which is around $800, which is a lot of money? Yeah, you could find these uh, on sale for like $650, $700, but it's still a lot. You can get so many different optics for that sort of price point, and some of them that I think are actually a little bit better than this. But more on that later. What do we have here? We have a 1 to 4 second focal plane LPVO featuring the P3TR reticle, like I mentioned. That scope shadow that you see right there in the in between magnifications between 2 and 3, that is simply because I have this thing perfectly set up for my go to rifle for myself. I put it in the GG and G mount, which is, by the way, unbelievable good value for money. They're fantastic. And this is just where it lays. So it's kind of in between. You see, I move it a single pick rail back, and we have no scope shadow. But when I move it another pick rail forward, like how I had it, you still have perfect view from like one and a half to like three and a half to four. So basically, no real issue. If you try that with a lot of one to sixes, it's not going to work out as well. And one to eights and one to tens, guess what? It probably won't work out at all. One of the key features on this thing is definitely the brightness of the illumination. It is so bright, it is so clear, it is so sharp, and in combination with the thick crosshairs, it is super functional. This combination means that no matter how far off the rifle you are, you practically can still look through it, find the illumination, and get centered on it perfectly. Steiner P4XI. These turrets are in MOA, so guess what? I can't really test to see if they're going to track perfectly well. Illumination on this thing is still stupid. And this battery is several years old at this point. I don't think I've you know what? I might not have ever even swapped this battery out. Anyway, without further ado, let's give this windage a quick twist. Turrets have a decent sound to them, but the clicks are a little mushy, and you can see it looks like there might be a little bit of movement. Yeah, you see it? Going, going to the left, or technically to the right, and you can see the gap from the top part of the reticle on the horizontal to the top part of the paper. And then I'm going to go to the left. You can see it looks like it changes ever so slightly. But that is really hard to quantifiably notice here. As far as slop in the erector on the windage, there is none. But it definitely looks like the reticle shifts up and down when we adjust the windage. It's not the first optic to do that. As far as the elevation goes, look at that. So if I'm going down, you'll notice that the reticle is more to the right. The second I start going up, it looks like it jogs back and forth that little probably tenth or two of a mil on the erector. Once that slop is taken up though, you can clearly see that it tracks vertically quite well. So, I mean, and it returns to zero just fine. 
But uh, yeah, there is definitely some erector slop in there. But this thing has thousands of rounds of 223 through it and works perfectly fine in every other regard. Like I already said, I have thousands of rounds of this gun. Put it through a brutality match and just generally beat the crap out of it all the time. And it still works very well. There is some erector slop, as you've seen, but ultimately it's not the end of the world. I didn't film a turret twisting on this because the turrets are really nothing special. And uh, just trying to keep this video kind of shortish, but um, <laughs> I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. For the rest of this video, I did remove my Butler Creek caps, which usually reside on this thing just to keep it clean. They don't really make that much of a difference for me when I get behind the gun. And they don't really take up too much of my view through it. As far as how flat the image is on this thing, keep in mind this is a 1 to 4 in second focal plane. So it's only got a 4x magnifier, which means the glass is not working all that hard. As a result, you get a very flat and usable image. The 1x on this thing is superb. There's no fisheye, there's no barrel distortion, there's no, no edge distortion. It just is basically perfect. When you get it just right, you can see there isn't that much of a, of a scope body to look through it, albeit at this exact position, we do get a little bit of shadow coming up between, like I showed you earlier, about 2 and 3x. Illumination on full during the daytime is still very clearly visible, and throughout all of its daytime brightness settings is noticeable all <laughs> throughout all of them. There are two different sort of brightness settings to this. There is a hard, there isn't a hard stop. There's a middle in between, and that middle goes from daytime mode to nighttime mode, and the nighttime mode is much softer. But the gradients in between it all have a very fine step to them. So this way you can really get it to the exact brightness setting that you want. One thing I do like about this illumination knob is that at the minimum and the maximum, there's off on either end of it. Sometimes when you have like the, the size six, perfect case in point, the size six, you had it had stops on either end, but on either end, it didn't have an off. So you have to go all the way up and then twist back to go one of the off positions in between. And I don't know, I just don't really particularly care for that. I'd much rather have an off position at either end. Here at 4x, again, you can see the image is very, very good. Flat, sharp, clear, crisp, no chromatic aberration to speak of. Again, this only being a 1 to 4, it's not really being stretched at all. What that means is that it's maximum magnification here at 4x, which is coincidentally where the BDC is calibrated for. Also, coincidentally, it's calibrated for a 5.56 average 16 inch barrel, like my Ruger is. And with either 55 grain or 62 grain ammunition, I've had very good success stretching this out to 500 meters at my friend's range that one time. And you know what? It just simply works. But at 4X, you have a very forgiving eye box, a very beautiful image, it's very clear, very crisp. And it just makes taking longer shots, even though you have less magnification, very, very easy. That's why I'm an advocate for sometimes less magnification is more. Because in my mind, I'd much rather have a much clearer, more usable image at both extremes and everywhere in between, as opposed to having, let's say, a Gen 3 Vortex Razor, where it's a 1 to 10. Yes, it's for a focal plane, so you could technically use it at any magnification, but the 1x wasn't that great, and the 10x wasn't that great. This, yeah, it's only a 1 to 4. You might have different quote-unquote limitations, but making full, making hits on full-size IPSC targets at distance is not hard. At Woodland Brutality, I took this exact this exact optic on my gun out to 300 yards on full-size IPSC. I only dropped it around because I didn't hold for it because I was shooting a little bit too fast. But other than that, it was stupendously perfect. Because it's also a 1 to 4 with 30 millimeter tube, it handles low light environments very well as well. There are no real dark edges, and you can clearly see here at its maximum 4x, it lets in all the ambient light in the sky that you can clearly see. Focusing our attention on the 400 yard brick building, yeah, it's only a 4x, but you can make out a lot of information there. Illumination on full daytime mode is very, very bright, but still very sharp as I slowly bring it down through the rest of the daylight modes into night mode, which is right there, you can clearly see the reticle gets significantly dimmer, but it's also still very easy to pick up right there at a very low light where you could just see that it's there, but it's just the right size where it's not too big and it still remains extremely sharp. Moving on to my home away from home, we can again see many different things going on here at once. Again, at 1x, there's only a slight bit of shift between the back berm and the side bit of concrete, but we still have a very flat and lovely looking image. Now, you might not be a fan of the P3TR reticle, 
I, though, absolutely love it. I love how it's really thick on the edge, and it comes to a much finer tip in the middle, but it still has incredibly bright illumination, and the drops are just the right size for me. It's very easy for me to be able to pick out which one's the second, third, fourth, and fifth. Also, the width will directly correlate what it is for a chest or a full-size ipsic at that distance, so it's very easy to use, in my opinion. And guess what? If you zero this for a 5.56 at 100 meters, you could take it out to basically 300 meters and have almost such a little drop that it almost doesn't even matter. I've been showing this thing off enough, so I'm going to skip through this so we can get to the eye box. But real quick, 4x at 50 yards. Do you expect anything less than a really good looking image like this? I sure as hell don't. And it absolutely performs and delivers. Look at all the detail you can make it on all the targets. Those are 5 inch bulls in the black. The smaller green targets are 2 inch. Back when I first originally started doing videos, I didn't include the eyebox test because, well, it wasn't something I was really thinking about. Now it's become a staple of my channel. The 1x on this thing, as you can clearly see with the illumination on full, is so forgiving and so big that I le legitimately took steps back to show you how far I can get away from it and still manage to look through with it. With it being second focal plane, the illumination is very clearly visible way off into the shadows, and it's fantastic. Even here at 2x, we really don't see that much of a diminished sort of eye box. Still very large, very easy to get behind. The illumination allows you to really pick up where it is and get right on center very quickly if you have, an, I'll say, less than adequate cheek weld. You always want to have a, a perfect cheek weld, but in the case that you can't, it's still fine. The 4x on this thing, as you've seen earlier, or you can guess, we have a full pick rails worth of movement at least to go from the one position that I'm filming at to the other position I can go to. So right off the bat, you know it's going to be good. And as you can clearly see, it is as big and as forgiving as you can get. Before we get into my ultimate final thoughts or put this up against some of its competition, I will say this. Yes, I really do love this optic. It works perfectly for me because it's exactly what I was looking for in an LPVL. Maybe not when I first bought it, but ultimately I grew to really appreciate it and use it very, very efficiently. And that's what it ultimately is going to come down to. Will you be able to use it properly? Is it going to fit what your system is going to be? And of course, your budget. Like I've said, this thing hovers around the $800 price point, and that's basically where I'm going to start this thing's major competition, or at least its main competitor in my opinion, which is going to be the Trigicon Credo HX 1-6 in second focal plane. Now, it's got to be the HX, because the HX has the very good bright illumination. The standard Credo or the first focal plane Credo has their segmented circle, and it just the illumination sucks by comparison. Though I think I prefer that reticle more overall, because I like the drops a little bit more. The reticle on the HX, with the exception of the illumination, isn't as good as or as usable as the one on the P4XI. The drops aren't as clear, crisp, or easy to pick up, and it's just, you know, not as versatile in my opinion, though the illumination is at least as bright. Overall image quality, from minimum to maximum, is excellent on the Credo HX, albeit not the best I've ever seen, but comparing it tit for tat right here with the P4XI, they are both extremely close. Trigicon you can get for around the same price, if not a little bit less, so really just a very good solid competitor across the board. With the exception, you get two extra X that are very usable, and you have an amazing warranty, which is probably the biggest thing that I'm worried about with Steiner. Their warranty leaves a lot to be desired, in my opinion. They're usually very delayed, they don't give you a lot of feedback about when they get it, and it just doesn't give me all the hope and trust that I, I expect from a company. Now, this next one isn't going to be exactly a direct competitor because the Loophold VX6 HD 1 to 6 literally costs almost twice the price. It's about 1500 bucks. And despite how well made it is, how lightweight it is, how beautiful the glass is from minimum to maximum, the eye box, the relief, everything is fantastic. But it's $1,500. The illumination is also garbage by comparison to both the Trigicon and the Steiner. However, if you want something that's American-made, that's going to have an amazing warranty and amazing glass, is it worth the bump up to something like this? Honestly, probably not. I'd probably go with the Trigicon over the Loophold. But giving you a side-by-side -side comparison to have you guys see what that extra 2x magnification looks like and what really high-quality glass looks like. But see, what about things like the PST Gen 2, the Razer HD, 
non E, you could have that for about a grand. It's a little bit more than the Steiner. Is it worth that extra price bump? Well, that's entirely up to you. I don't have the best footage on those optics to make it a level playing field with my new style of filming because this is a lot more easy to put side by side with basically anything that I've done the last year or so. All the other stuff that I've filmed that I would make a point to have it be a comparison between the two is all different footage and it's not going to look as good side by side. Honestly, the Razer is still a decent option. The 9E is going to be very heavy. It's literally 8 ounces heavier than this. And the PST is going to be about 5 ounces heavier than this. So there is that to consider. To briefly mention the new reticle for the P4XI, the G1 that Steiner recently introduced, I don't particularly care for it. Maybe the center dot with a triangle would be okay for really close engagements, but anything out of distance, I just don't think it's going to work out that well. And instead of having drops like how the P3TR does, it's just got a little milling section. But again, you might like that. Me, personally, I'm not going to. Finally, with all that being said, taking my personal opinion and my history with this thing and throwing it out the window is it still a good optic well for the most part yes it's light it's small it's compact it's got excellent glass it's got very forgiving eye box it's got great illumination most of the controls are very good the illumination control could use a slightly stiffer detent when you turn it sometimes it's very easy to just go past where you want it to accidentally have it go off accidentally bump it and turn it on it's happened to me in the past. The dials for both elevation and windage, they can be fine-tuned significantly better. They do have a lot of mush to them. They do have a nice positive audible click, but there are better ways to skin that cat, a la anything Trijicon does. As far as the magnification ring, there is a little bit of play developing in it, but I do have a massive throw lever and have used it relentlessly over the last couple of years. So factoring all that in, I think it's doing pretty good. For around the $800 mark, I think these are a little bit overpriced, especially for the warranty, and that's the biggest part. If you can find these on sale for around five, six hundred bucks, it makes it much more appealing. Or if you can find it used for in the fours, and hopefully it's in good enough shape, that's really compelling. But there are a lot of other options out there for you if you so choose. Anyway, thank you all very much for watching. And as always, see you again next time. And a huge thank you to my Patreon providers and my Subscribestar subscribers. Without you, this truly wouldn't be possible. If you'd like to support my channel but don't want to join either of those, I completely understand. But you can still help by using my affiliate links in the description below, and or like, share, and subscribe as always. Again, thank you very much.